in June of 2023, as part of their 100 Years series, oh, yes, uh, elementary age kids, uh, you guys may be dismissed for Kids Church. Thank you. Uh, in June of 2023, 20, as part of their 100 Year series, the American Film Institute announced their 100 Heroes and Villains list. Heroes are great, right? Heroes are the ones who prevail in the midst of extreme circumstances. They have a strong sense of morality, of courage, and purpose. They have their flaws, it's true, but they tend to make up for those flaws by showing, uh, somehow sacrificing themselves in some way. And we find hope and we find inspiration in our heroes. But truth be told, and I I didn't realize this until I started putting this sermon together, I've always been more fascinated with villains. Uh, and I don't know what that says about me as a person. Uh, no need to psychoanalyze right now. But uh, in many ways, these are the more interesting characters, right? Take, for instance, the movie The Silence of the Lambs. When you think of that movie, who do you think of? Hannibal the Cannibal Lecter. Am I right? Nobody thinks of Clarice Starling. Not that Jodie Foster did a poor job of acting because she won the Academy Award for Best Actress in a Leading Role for her performance as Clarice Starling. And it's not that Clarice was a weak character. She was actually the sixth ranked hero on AFI's list of top 50 heroes. But come on, let's be real. The only reason you remember Clarice is because of the way Dr. Dr. Lecter said, Clarice. And you may not remember much about the movie, but I bet you remember one of the greatest puns in the history of cinema. I'm having an old friend for dinner. Such a great line. And don't get me started about Samuel L. Jackson's performance as Mr. Glass in M. Night Shyamalan's movie called Unbreakable. Unbreakable is a part of a trilogy, and according to medium.com, what this trilogy essentially asks is what if comic books are merely an exaggeration of the truth? What if superheroes and villains existed among us? Now, I'm not big into comic books or graphic novels. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with them. It's just not my cup of tea. But the question of the existence of superheroes and villains, that's an intriguing one. And I say this because, as Christians, we can think of our own worldview in terms of a story that can be summarized in four words. The first word is creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The second word is fall. Having been tempted by the devil, Adam disobeys God and sin enters the world, tarnishing and tainting all of God's creation. Humanity, the greatest of God's creative work, is now marred by sin. Not only do we sin, but we now have a sin nature, and so we are separated. We are at odds in rebellion toward and guilty before God. Now God, being a perfectly holy and just God, must punish humanity for their sins, and that punishment is death. There's nothing humanity can do to save itself. That's the fall. The third word is redemption. Here, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, he sends his one and only son to live the perfect life we could not live, to die the death we should have died. He sacrificed himself for us. God accepted that sacrifice, and Jesus was raised back to life. And for those who believe and place their trust in Jesus for their salvation, Jesus takes away their sin and guilt and replaces that with his righteousness. He takes away the wrath of God and turns it into God's favor. We are no longer separated from God. We now have peace with him, and we have been reconciled to him. We are no longer slaves to sin, but we have been bought with a price, paid by Jesus, so that we have freedom in Christ. That is redemption. And the fourth word is consummation. Jesus came to this earth once, and Jesus will come to this earth again. And when he does, he will make all things new. He will establish a new heaven 
and a new earth. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more. There will be no mourning or crying. There will be no more pain, and we will be with him for the rest of eternity. In four words, that's our view of the world. That's our story of reality. And within that story, we see a very real hero, Jesus. And by way of the Trinity, God himself is a hero. But we also see a very real villain. In your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll start reading in verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. What or who is the greatest enemy of humanity? Some say fear. Others say time. Still others, infectious disease. The most interesting answer I found was mosquitoes. And maybe this is tied to infectious disease, but apparently there are more deaths attributed to mosquito bites and the diseases uh, that the mosquitoes carry than any other kind of death worldwide. So mosquitoes are humanity's worst enemy. Friedrich Nietzsche says that the self is our worst enemy. But the most common answer I found was humanity. We are our own worst enemy. But take a look at verses 11 and 12. Contrary to the popular opinion, the Apostle Paul tells us that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. The word that Paul uses for wrestle can also mean conflict or battle. And the only time it's used in the New Testament is right here in this passage. Now, if we take the term to mean battle, then why doesn't Paul use another word that clearly means that? Well, according to one commentator, the term Paul used was used to indicate that the fully armored soldier was also an accomplished wrestler who on occasion would be involved in close quarter struggle against a cunning opponent. Due to the cunning schemes of the devil, believers need to be ready for both remote and close at hand assaults. So Paul tells us that we are in a battle. This is warfare. But our opposition, our enemy, is not human. Now some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, Didn't Jesus tell us to love our human enemies? Didn't he say something about that? And now Paul is saying that humans are really not our enemies? Isn't that a contradiction? It's not, and here's why. Beyond our human enemies, beyond our human enemies, our spiritual enemies. In other words, while we are called to love our flesh and blood enemies, in a greater way, in a more ultimate sense, our enemy is spiritual. The rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over the present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, all of whom, as we see in verse 11, are subject to the devil. So the villain in the Christian story is the devil. South Columbia, our greatest enemy, is the devil, and every day we are fighting spiritual battles in a spiritual war. We need to be reminded of this because we forget what we don't see out of sight, out of mind. But the moment we open our eyes in the morning, we wake up on the battlefield. Now, I want us to see this spiritual realm and the spiritual warfare that's taking place there by having the Apostle John tell us about two signs that he saw. So please turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, the very center of the book of Revelation. Now, I'm hoping this will help us to see the bigger picture, the view from atop the trees so that we can fight the good fight on the ground. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 1, and this is a fascinating read. 
And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring and those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. That is an amazing passage. So what should we know about Revelation? Revelation. Now, before we delve into this passage, there are some things that we should know about the book of Revelation. First, we should know that Revelation consists of several different types of writings, one of which is apocalyptic. An apocalyptic writing is usually characterized uh, as having a lot of symbolism. Second, it's usually written to give, those, uh, to give hope to those who are being persecuted or under the threat of persecution. Third, there are also many references to the Old Testament. With all that in mind, let's unpack this passage by first identifying who the dragon, the child, and the woman are. Let's start with the easy ones. John tells us in verse 3 that the dragon is a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. Now that's a picture. The dragon is drawn from Old Testament imagery of evil kingdoms who are enemies of Israel. So from Psalm 74, 14, the dragon is Egypt. In Isaiah 27, 1, he is Assyria and Babylon. But the dragon isn't just a metaphor for an evil kingdom, but for the devil himself, who is the one behind these kingdoms. As one commentator put it, against this background, the dragon of John's vision would immediately be understood as the arch enemy of God and his people. In other words, the dragon is the devil. The color red symbolizes the murderous and oppressive character of the dragon. The numbers 7 and 10 symbolize completeness. So the 10 horns speak to the great oppressive power that the dragon has. And the seven heads refers to its worldwide effect. The seven diadems or crowns on his heads represents his own claims to victory, sovereignty, or authority, which is in direct opposition to the true king of kings and lord of lords, who also wears 
many diadems. To sum up, this dragon is a murderer who has a worldwide reach, is great in power, and fancies himself the victor. Then in verse 9, John tells us directly who this dragon is. The ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Ancient serpent identifies the devil as a serpent in the Garden of Eden. The name Satan means adversary or the prosecutor who accuses people before God in the heavenly court. And we see this most clearly in the book of Job, where in chapter 1, Satan accuses Job of honoring God for his own personal advantage. And then John identifies the dragon as the deceiver of the whole world. And so what we see here is that two of the devil's most used tools are that of accusation and deception. The devil is an accuser, and he's deceptive. So the dragon is Satan. We'll get to the woman in just a little bit, but we find in verse 5 that she gives birth to a male child. The description that John provides, that this child is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne, is Jesus. This is a a reference to Psalm 2. Starting in verse 7, the psalmist writes, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make your nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now this is a messianic prophecy that Jesus fulfills. This is how we know that verse 5 is referring to Jesus. So we've established that the dragon is the devil, and the male child is Jesus Christ. Now we've come to the woman. When we read that the woman gave birth to a male child who happens to be Jesus, we immediately think of Mary. And there is a sense in which Mary is being pictured here. However, I think we can argue from Scripture that who John had in mind here is not primarily Mary, but rather the whole people of God. Here's what I mean. In chapter 12, verse 1, John sees a great sign. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. The sun, the moon, and the 12 stars is a reference back to Genesis 37, 9, which is about Joseph's dream. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So the sun represents Jacob, the moon his wife, and the twelve stars would be the twelve tribes of Israel. These are symbols representing the people of God. Furthermore, the number twelve all throughout Revelation symbolize the people of God. You have the twelve tribes of Israel, you have the twelve apostles. So what we have here is that the woman who is giving birth is a symbol of God's people in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, Jim, I get the sun, the moon, and the stars represent the Old Testament people of God. But how do you get that she symbolizes the New Testament people of God also? Take a look at verse 17. It says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Her offspring include those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And so we get from that that the woman symbolizes not only the Old Testament people of God, but the church also. And by the way, this is, this is a, another reason why the woman is probably not Mary, because then the devil would be making war with Mary's literal offspring, Jesus' siblings, which doesn't make much sense. It makes much more sense to understand the woman and her offspring as God's people. So the people of God are pregnant and are about to give birth to a Messiah. Does that make sense? Well, as a matter of fact, the Old Testament speaks to this. In Isaiah 66, starting at verse 7, uh, it says, Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. 
Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. So you have Zion, or God's people, collectively giving birth. Again, in Jeremiah 4, uh, verse 31, it says, For I heard a cry as of a woman in labor, anguish as of one giving birth to her first child, the cry of the daughter of Zion gasping for breath, stretching out her hands. Woe is me, I'm fainting before murderers. Here again, Zion, the people of God, are depicted as giving birth. And so we see that the dragon is the devil, the male child is Jesus Christ, and the woman is God's people. Now that we see who the main players are, we need to understand that Revelation chapter 12 is about an ongoing conflict between these players. It's an ongoing conflict between the two signs that that John sees. The devil rages against Jesus Christ and rages against the people of God. And so in this passage, what happens in verses 1 through 6 is just told again in the rest of the chapter, but in greater detail. Now, we won't be able to go into every nook and cranny of this passage, but there are a few things that I want to point out. The first point I want to make is that the devil rages against the Messiah. Take a look at verse 4. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now this refers to all the ways in which the devil tried to tempt and kill Jesus throughout his earthly life. Here, we should think of King Herod and how he tried to kill Jesus as a child. Think of how Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness. And ultimately, think of the crucifixion of Jesus. The devil rages against the Messiah. And it's here at the cross that it seems that Satan had finally succeeded. Now, I don't know if this is a legend or if this is a true story. But the story goes that there was a, a, a chess grand master, and he was traveling, and he went to Paris and was at the Louvre, uh, and he saw uh, a painting. And um, uh, there are other paintings there, like the Mona Lisa and that sort of thing, but this one particular painting really caught his attention. And remember, he's a grand master chess player. So in the painting, you have the devil on one side playing chess against a young boy. And the devil, uh, you could see the arrogance in him. You could see that he was winning and that he knew he was going to win. And you could see the sweat on the boy on the other side. And I think, as the legend goes, that they were playing for the soul of the boy. And so that's why he's uh, in such turmoil. And so the chess grandmaster looks up, and he stares at this painting, and he stares for a long time. And then what he does is he asks he asks somebody to bring him uh, a chess set, and he sets up the chess set just like it is in the painting. And he looks at the painting, and he looks at the chess set. And he looks at the painting, and he looks at the chess set. And what he realizes is that according to the arrangement of the pieces left on the chessboard, the king had one more move. This fateful move would make him the winner of the game. And it turns out that the painting is called checkmate. So you think that the devil has checkmated the other player, but it turns out to be the other way around. And so it is with Jesus. We think that the cross symbolizes or shows the defeat of Jesus. But it's the resurrection of Jesus that proved otherwise. At the cross, going back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, Satan had but bruised the heel of Jesus, but Jesus crushed the head of Satan. It may have appeared that Satan was victorious, but the cross of Christ marked the defeat of Satan. And we see in verse 5, the whole earthly life and ministry of Jesus summed up in one short sentence. After defeating Satan, Jesus ascends to his throne in heaven. He is the victor. He is exalted. 
The picture of verses 7 through 9 is Satan being thrown down to the earth. He was defeated. As a result, there's rejoicing in heaven. And now take a look at verses 10 through 12. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is short. Which brings me to my second point. The devil rages not only against the Messiah, but the devil rages against the Messiah's church. Take a look at verse 6. Jesus had just ascended to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. We continue in verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So the Messiah has ascended to his throne, and the people of God are now in the wilderness. The wilderness represented a place of trial and testing on the one hand. But on the other hand, it also represented a place of God's provision and protection. Now the 1,260 days, the time, times, and half a time, and in other places, the three and a half years and the 42 months, they all mean the same thing. It represents the church age from the time of Jesus' ascension to the time of Jesus' return. It is a time we now find ourselves in. What this means is that we, the people of God, are in the wilderness. It's a time of trial, and it's a time of testing. But it's also a time of God's provision and God's protection. This is a warning to us. The devil rages against the church. In 1 Peter 5, 18, Peter writes, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour But I'm reminded of the words of Martin Luther's, A mighty fortress is our God. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for thou hast willed thy truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little world, one little word shall fell him. The devil rages against the Messiah, and the devil rages against the Messiah's church. But as Luther says, his rage we can endure. And here's why. Verse 15 tells us that the devil tries to sweep us away with what comes out of his mouth. Remember that the chief tools of the devil are deception and accusation. He is a deceiver, and he is an accuser. These are the words that come out of his mouth. Now, verse 11 tells us how we, too, how we can overcome the devil. First, they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. Remember Job and how Satan accused him? Satan can no longer accuse us of our sins because our sins have been forgiven. We have been declared not guilty of the accusations levied against us. We have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. His rage we can endure. Second, they have conquered him by the word of their testimony. Remember Eve in the garden and how she was deceived? But we have the truth of the word of God. We can fight his lies and his deception with God's truth. His rage we can endure. Let's pray.